Good morning. Good morning. We're here with uh, Rich Mayer this morning. And thank you so much for joining us. And Rich, would you start by telling us a little bit about yourself? Well, sure. Um, well, I'm a professor of psychology here at <clears throat> University of California, Santa Barbara, um, on the shores of the Pacific Ocean. And um, my research really involves what I would call applying the science of learning to education. So this is kind of uh, an interdisciplinary field that's at the intersection of cognitive psychology and education and technology. Um, and in particular, at least recently, I've gotten interested in what I call multimedia learning, which is how people learn from words and pictures and how we can help them learn more effectively. Great, thank you. Sure. How long have you been at UC Santa Barbara? Um, well, I, um, I know this will be shocking. I, I've been here since 1975. You're probably thinking, he looks so young. But, <laughs> but this was uh, essentially my first job. I, I, um, uh, after I graduated from University of Michigan, um, I taught at Indiana University for two years, and then I came out here. Been here ever since. I've been here ever since, okay. yes. Great. How did you get interested in this field? Um, yeah, that's a really interesting question. I, I don't really think about that sometimes, but I think my, my focus has always been on uh, the question of how can we help people learn in ways so they can take what they've learned and apply it to new situations? So that's kind of the classic issue of transfer that's, you know, been with both psychology and education from the very start of both of those fields. So it's a, so it's a issue that has a long history, but it's also one that I think is really important, um, both theoretically and, and practically. So I like a question that has both theoretical um, goals and practical goals. Um, so really what I've been trying to understand is, um, I guess, how do you teach for transfer? Um, how do you promote uh, meaningful learning? So that's, that's kind of what got me interested or what got me started. Well, speaking of getting started, could you describe your career path? Uh, talk a little bit about um, uh, where you went to grad school and then uh, take us through uh, descriptions of your, your different jobs along the way? Sure, sure. So um, even to go a little bit before that, I guess, um, you know, I guess I'm a product of public education from kindergarten through graduate school. I, I, my K-12 education was in uh, Cincinnati Public Schools where I kind of enjoyed the nerdy subjects of math and science. And then I, I got a BA, or I guess a BS in psychology at um, Miami University in Oxford, Ohio, which is just really near Cincinnati. And then um, for graduate school, um, I just went up the road to Ann Arbor, um, and I was fortunate enough to um, be admitted to a graduate program in cognitive psychology and to work with uh, Jim Greeno at, at the University of Michigan. Um, and that's really where I, you know, developed what, um, my interests in, in this field that I'm involved in now. Okay, good. And then, of course, you went on, you went on to Indiana from uh, right. graduating? And then um, I graduated in 1973, and uh, my first job was, uh, I guess, a visiting assistant professor job at Indiana University in Bloomington. Um, where coincidentally our first son was born. <laughs> um, so we've never let him forget he's a Hoosier. <laughs> and then um, I had the good fortune to land a job here at UCSB in 1975, and I've, I've been here ever since. Okay, how would you describe your research interests and aspirations when you first started your career? Um, I would say, um, you know, my interests and aspirations probably haven't really changed that much. I've always been interested in uh, the issue of transfer and how, do you, how, do, how can you teach people so that they can use what they've learned in new situations. So that's kind of been the driving question. Kind of the specific venues I've studied that in have changed maybe a little bit from more paper-based environments to more um, computer-based environments. but. The same underlying issue has been pretty consistent. What were some of the major ideas or approaches that stimulated your professional growth? Yeah, I, I, that's a really good question. Um, so, you know, just in terms of concepts, I think 
kind of the issues that caught my attention as a grad student and still I, are still probably motivating my work are the distinction between meaningful and rote learning. Like what, um, what happens when somebody engages in meaningful learning? What's, um, um, uh, what are the cognitive processes and what, are the, what kind of knowledge is produced when you engage in meaningful learning rather than rote learning? And that's also related to the classic, really gestalt idea of insight. You know, what, why are some people able to come up with creative solutions to problems and how can we prepare them to better be able to do that? So can, those are kind of the, I guess, some of the concepts I've been trying to deal with. And then let's see, um, in terms of theoretical frameworks, I guess I've been working in a information processing theoretical um, framework. Um, so looking at the idea that learning occurs in a human information processing system that has a very limited working memory and that that really dictates um, a lot about how to design effective instruction I think and I guess um, what else from a kind of methodological point of view I've kind of taken a uh, an experimental approach and focused on trying to run rigorous experiments to answer the questions I have. Could I veer off, of, since we're on the topic of, sure, of, course. Uh, of your research interests regarding uh, principles that um, guide meaningful learning, can you talk a little bit, would you feel sure. okay about talking a little bit about principles that sure. support meaningful learning? Yeah, you know, I think what I've been been trying to do over the years is to contribute to the science of instruction by developing research-based principles for how to design effective instruction. And I've been trying to contribute to the science of learning really by trying to come up with a research-based theory of, of how people learn that's, that's relevant for education, for more um, authentic learning situations. A couple of decades, we've come up with about a dozen um, research-based principles for how to design um, what, what, what I call multimedia learning. So this is learning that involves words and graphics, uh, which is most <laughs> instruction, a PowerPoint presentation, a textbook, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, computer-based training. They're, they all are generally multimedia learning environments. Um, what's an another uh, so that's a technique that's kind of aimed at um, what I call reducing extraneous processing because it's reducing your scanning back and forth. A technique that's kind of focused on um, what I call managing essential processing. Uh, essential processing involves uh, learning when the topic is, co is complex and it might, it might be overwhelming but we can't really reduce the amount of information because that's what we want you to learn. So one technique is what I call segmenting, which is to break a complicated uh, lesson into manageable parts and make sure the learner understands each part before you move on to the next one. So if you have a, a continuous narrated animation on how lightning storms work, one thing we've done is to break it into short segments of about 10 seconds each and after each one you click on a continue button to go on to the next one, that allows the learner to, um, you know, digest one idea before moving on to the next one. So we call that segmenting. Does that make sense? Yeah. And um, the third kind of category of techniques is what we call um, fostering generative processing. So generative processing is the deeper kind of processing that, that uh, involves relating what you're learning to prior knowledge and mentally reorganizing it. Um, and one technique that we've looked at for doing, accomplishing that is what we call the personalization principle where uh, instead of using formal language we use um, uh, conversational language like uh, first and second person using I and you instead of just third person or if it's an online tutor having the tutor be polite rather than just giving direct feedback being a little polite with the feedback. Um, who are some of the people who've had the most impact on your professional growth? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question too. A lot of people. I mean, I just am indebted to so many people. But, um, you know, starting with my parents, I guess, who really instilled a love of learning and, um, and also uh, 
uh, respect for hard work. Um, and I guess my, my teachers along the way who um, gave me the self-confidence that I might be able to actually learn something. <laughs> um, and I guess in graduate school, I owe, I owe a debt to my mentor, Jim Greeno at University of Michigan. And um, certainly over the years, my students and colleagues, I, I've just been really lucky to be able to work with some really brilliant and talented people who have really stimulated a lot of my own thinking. What do you think was the greatest accomplishment of your career so far and why? You know, I'll, what I've been trying to do, uh, I don't know how successful I've been, is to, um, I think as I mentioned before, um, contribute to the science of learning by developing a theory of learning that um, kind of is based on more authentic learning situations. I mean, the science of learning has a long history that goes back, you know, more than a hundred years. Um, but a lot of it was based on kind of artificial learning situations. And I think by trying to study more authentic situations, we can develop more powerful theories of how people learn. So that's, that's what I've been trying to do. And, uh, you know, the theory that I've been working on, I call the cognitive theory of multimedia learning, which is really just borrows ideas from lots of other people. Yeah. I don't really think it's, that, it's not original, but what I'm trying to do is come up with an explanation of, you know, how learning works. And kind of the three main cognitive processes in meaningful learning, according to that theory, are uh, selecting the relevant information. So when you're in a learning situation, one thing you have to do as a learner is just pay attention to what's important. So I call that selecting relevant information. You have to mentally organize that into a coherent representation. I call that organizing. So you have to mentally organize the incoming information into a um, cognitive structure. And then lastly, you ha the third process is integrating, which involves um, connecting the incoming information with relevant prior knowledge that you activate from long-term memory and also connecting it with other incoming information. So those three processes, selecting, organizing, and integrating, are kind of at the heart of, I think, this theory of meaningful learning. So that's one thing I've been trying to do. And then uh, in terms of the uh, um, science of instruction, I've been trying to come up with uh, research-based principles of how you should design instruction that have an empirical base to them and also a theoretical base to them. So we've already discussed some of that. How would you like to be remembered within our profession? <laughs> I'll, I'll leave that to other people too, but, but um, <laughs> you know, one thing I've kind of um, tried to emphasize is that, you know, in education, it's very easy to slip into a focus on ideology and opinions and fads, and a lot of educational practice is, is based on, on those things. So. I've tried to at least show that you can take a scientific approach to a lot of educational issues um, and that it's possible to answer a lot of educational questions by, you know, rigorous um, scientific evidence rather than ideology or opinions or fads. Right, right. And that's a significant contribution. It's a, it's a constant struggle yeah. sometimes in the field of education to, um, to show the benefit of a scientific approach. <laughs> <laughs> But we need that, and your work has been exemplary in that area. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Now, I didn't ask you this um, earlier, but in my email, but um, would you mind talking about your plans for the future? Oh, sure. I, I've, um, you know, I haven't never really planned out as, um, a research path. I just kind of go with what seems interesting at the time, because I think intellectual curiosity is really what should drive your, your research. So I try to study things that I just am very interested in. Yeah. Um, so I, I've, you know, I've kind of developed, I kind of have moved from, like I said, studying paper-based um, learning situations to more computer-based. So that's a lot of the multimedia learning research. But that's kind of gotten me interested now in educational games. So I, I've been starting to um, try to understand whether educational games can be a useful mm -hmm. um, device for helping people learn science and math and, and other subjects. Because there are a lot of strong claims made for educational games and there are a lot of really smart visionaries who have these 
very nice pictures of what the future is going to be <laughs> based on games, but I think somebody needs to do the, you know, the basic research on what works and what doesn't work and what are the features of games that are effective or not effective. So that's, I call that the value added approach. So that, that's what I've kind of gotten an interest in lately. Well, we'll look forward to your contributions in those areas, too. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much, Rich. I don't have any further questions. Oh, for you. well, thank you very much. I thank enjoyed you. it.